Well, it's noon, so we will start the program. Um, everyone, we're very happy to have Dr. Leslie Schwal here to present the rich history of Emancipation Day celebrations in Iowa. Um, this program is part of the Iowa City Equity and Human Rights Lens Series. Um, at least once a month and sometimes more, we offer uh, programs on uh, various aspects of equity, human rights, uh, and other topics of interest. So please check our website, uh, icgov.org, on the Equity and Human Rights page for upcoming programs. This program is also being recorded, so if um, someone who wanted to see it has missed it, um, it will be uh, available on City Channel 4 probably next week. Um, watch our webpage and news releases for uh, when it goes up. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping details. If you have questions, Dr. Schwalm will be happy to answer them. There will be ample time for questions after her talk. Um, please put your questions in the question and answer box and um, we will be doing all the questions at the end. Uh, so Dr. Schwalm is a professor emeritus of history and gender, women's and sexuality studies at the University of Iowa. And she has written several books about women's experiences of slavery, emancipation, and the Civil War. So we are very happy to have her present this program and I'm going to turn it over to her now. Thank you, Kristen. I just wanted to thank Kristen and the city of Iowa City for sponsoring this gathering today and for everyone who's in attendance. I look forward to your questions at the end. So uh, today uh, we're going to talk about three themes. We're going to talk about the history of emancipation celebrations in the US generally, but then quickly turn to how Iowans have commemorated emancipation in the past and how and why those celebrations and commemorations changed over time. Now, Iowans have celebrated the end of slavery for more than 160 years. This is uh, a cultural tradition with a long and rich history. The modern commemoration of slavery's end today is celebrated as Juneteenth. And Juneteenth, or the 19th of June, uh, refers to the day on June 19th, 1865, in Galveston, Texas, when General Gordon Granger announced freedom for the people who remained enslaved in Texas. Um, and uh, this was, of course, more than two years uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation had supposedly freed people. So people were still being held in slavery and the Union Army brought uh, news of, the, of their freedom as well as the power to enforce it. So Juneteenth was a long time Texas holiday, uh, a, a state holiday recognized in black communities across the state. Iowa's uh, Juneteenth commemoration began much more recently in Des Moines uh, in 1990. And in April of 2002, thanks to the organizing work of Gary Lawson and the Iowa Juneteenth Celebration Committee, our governor, Tom Vilsack, signed legislation establishing Juneteenth as a state holiday. And Iowa was the seventh state to officially recognize Juneteenth Day. And then finally, uh, President Biden uh, in 2021 made Juneteenth a federal holiday. So that's the modern celebration. And we might then ask why were uh, Black Iowans celebrating emancipation before the Civil War, and they were indeed. Uh, the earliest uh, newspaper report I've seen of a Iowa Emancipation Day celebration is 1857. So why were Black Americans across the Northern states celebrating emancipation when 
slavery was still legal and, uh, and practiced uh, across the South. Well, for two reasons, uh, Black Americans celebrated emancipation. One was at the state level as the Northern states passed gradual emancipation laws, uh, which generally state by state uh, emancipated future generations of enslaved people. And as each state passed these laws, local uh, African-American communities would celebrate the passage of those laws. So that was one reason that uh, uh, emancipation was being celebrated before the Civil War. But the other and uh, in some ways more compelling reason that there were Emancipation Day celebrations uh, was in recognition of the fact that in August of 1834, England emancipated all of the enslaved people in the British West Indies, uh, several hundred thousand enslaved people gaining their freedom. Uh, this was, uh, became a very important uh, commemorative day in U.S. communities. Uh, it was celebrated both because the West Indies uh, consisted of a very major slaveholding colony, and this meant freedom for many, many people, but also because England's actions signaled the possibility that the United States could do the same thing. So when people gathered as they did early in August uh, from 1834 forward, American celebrants contrasted Britain's liberation of West Indian enslaved people with the continued betrayal of enslaved people in the US. And these celebrants often emphasized the hypocrisy of July 4th celebrations that tended to exalt American liberties when so many uh, people of African descent remained in slavery. So uh, turning from that sort of national picture of, of pre-Civil War celebrations, let's turn to the question of why Black Iowans celebrated emancipation before the Civil War. The most important reason is that slavery was a familiar and constant threat in Iowa as both a territory and as a state. Slavery touched the lives of all Black Iowans. Uh, first of all, uh, we should recognize that in the 1830s, the 1840s, the 1850s, the majority of Black Americans who came to Iowa uh, had either themselves been enslaved or came from families that had experienced slavery in an earlier generation. And even though territorial, state, and federal law made slavery illegal in Iowa, many of the state's earliest Black settlers were actually held illegally in slavery some of them even owned by territorial and state officials. So here you see uh, the top left uh, photographs of two Black Iowans who were held illegally as slaves. Uh, Henry Harrison Triplett, uh, who was brought into Iowa along with his family and held in slavery until 1854. And Lydia Applewhite, uh, who was born into slavery in Missouri and brought by her owners into Keokuk, Iowa and held there as a slave. So these are just two examples of Black Iowans uh, who knew very well uh, that slavery had a, a threatening uh, appearance in Iowa. To the right, you see, uh, I've copied a runaway slave advertisement from the uh, Burlington Daily newspaper that was published in 1840. Uh, and of course, this slave owner from Pike County, Missouri is publishing that advertisement in Burlington because he expects that these three uh, enslaved men who had fled him uh, might make their way to Iowa. So this meant African-Americans living in Burlington at the time had to be careful that uh, slave catchers did not 
uh, interrupt with their freedom, right? So uh, it's very important to recognize that uh, emancipation was something Black Iowans yearned for, not only for their uh, kin in the South, but also for themselves. They knew, like African Americans knew across the nation, that as long as slavery persisted in the United States, Black freedom was compromised. Now, here I have um, a couple of, uh, again, newspaper articles that give us a sense of Black Iowans who were uh, engaged in Emancipation Day celebrations. The top article is actually from the New York Times in 1855, and it, tell us, it tells us that Charlotta Piles, they've misspelled her name here, um, who was at that time a resident of Keokuk, Iowa, uh, but who was on a national tour in an effort to collect funds uh, because she was trying to uh, buy her son and her son-in-law out of slavery. Charlotta had come with part of her family to Keokuk and uh, they were uh, very um, committed to bringing the rest of the family out of slavery. So here she has attended New York City's Emancipation Day celebration knowing she would find allies there who might help her in her endeavor. The second newspaper article is from 1859 uh, from Muscatine's uh, paper and it reports on uh, the August 1st Emancipation Day celebration held uh, in Muscatine that included a procession, martial music, a, a procession to uh, an area uh, outside of town where uh, people held a dinner and listened to speeches by uh, several of the sort of prominent men in Muscatine, uh, African American men who some would rise to very important positions of civil rights leadership uh, in the future. So these are just a couple of examples of, of how we know Black Iowans were involved in Emancipation Day celebrations. Now the Civil War changed things. It changed both uh, the calendar of Emancipation Day celebrations and also the reason for celebrating emancipation in the US. Most of us are familiar with the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation which President Lincoln issued on January 1st as an executive order. But I want you to understand that the war introduced a lot of new dates that would be commemorated uh, in the future. Uh, Washington DC continues now to commemorate uh, the emancipation of enslaved people in the District of Columbia uh, by an act of Congress in April 1862. Uh, many communities would uh, celebrate September 22nd, which is when in 1862 Lincoln announced that he would uh, issue the Emancipation Proclamation in January. Um, Juneteenth, of course, we know uh, is the uh, modern uh, version of emancipation celebrations. Uh, other communities would celebrate the December 1865 ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. This is the amendment that uh, banned slavery except for the treatment of imprisoned people in the United States. And then lastly, uh, February 12th, Lincoln's birthday, would also become a holiday in many communities, particularly after uh, his 1865 assassination. So as you see, lots of, of new dates to celebrate, but all of them focused on the end of slavery in the United States. Of course, this was the most important change that now 4 million people held in bondage and all of their descendants were liberated from slavery, uh, and so uh, 
January 1st becomes a, a, a particularly prominent date to celebrate as a result. But I want you to understand that uh, the uh, tradition of celebrating in August, because of that tradition of celebrating emancipation in the British West Indies, would continue for some 150 years. So what we really see is not a, uh, uh, a replacement of earlier celebration dates, but rather the addition of new dates to celebrate. And I suspect this could have been for a couple of reasons. People continued to celebrate in August because they wanted to honor what their parents and grandparents had done, but also perhaps because it is easier to have parades and picnics in August than in January in Iowa. So what did uh, these 19th century Iowa celebrations look like? What did they include? Um, I wanna uh, point out that in this, in the next slide, I have uh, some photographs illustrating Emancipation Day celebrations, but sadly, these are not from Iowa. Uh, and I'm hopeful that maybe some of the people who are uh, tuned in today might take the time to go through family photos and see if you have any uh, historic photos of Emancipation Day celebrations in Iowa. These are images from Austin, Texas and Richmond, Virginia, but they give us a really great sense of the spirit of, of those celebrations. So as I've noted, Iowans began commemorating emancipation as early as 1857 uh, and uh, this first celebration that I have found reported uh, was held in Muscatine, Iowa. This is a community that was very politically active. Uh, so it's not surprising to me that uh, this is where we see the earliest record. Um, on that morning in uh, early August, 1857, people gathered at their uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church in the community. They gathered there, they organized into a formal procession and marched through the city of Muscatine to a local park. Once they arrived, the celebrants listened to speeches by local leaders. They enjoyed music by Muscatine's African Brass Band, which is an interesting note to know that, you know, even this early in the 19th century, there was an organized uh, practiced band. Uh, the celebrants then shared a dinner and then they returned in procession to their church for uh, uh, yet another talk, this one on education, undoubtedly uh, speaking against the exclusion of their children from public schools. And perhaps another topic that would have been discussed that day would have been the March 1857 Supreme Court ruling in Dred Scott versus Sanford, which declared that African Americans could claim no citizenship rights in the US. That day among the masterful speakers uh, who held the audience's attention were Alexander Clark, who would become one of the state's most successful and politically active African Americans, and the Reverend Richard H. Kane, uh, then deacon uh, in the city's uh, AME church, who would later become very well known because of his election uh, to two terms as a US Senator from South Carolina during Reconstruction, and later his consecration as a bishop of the AME Church in 1880. All of this is to say that uh, in Muscatine, we had the seeds of a very important uh, civil rights activism and uh, Emancipation Day celebrations was one of the way uh, that the community gathered to talk about these issues. Now, uh, after the Civil War, emancipation celebrations really proliferated in the 19th century, and Black Iowans created a cultural tradition uh, that drew from several threads, including uh, solemn, formal rituals of commemoration that included prayers and orations, 
uh, sermons and recitals. They also drew on the exuberant sociability uh, of festivals, uh, including music and dancing, games, food, sometimes drinking. And then also the public performance of civic culture. That is the demonstration of a people uh, who could organize uh, and perform citizenship, uh, for example, in semi-military parades and processions. These gatherings often included a call for the extension and enforcement of civil and political rights, including the rights guaranteed through the 14th and 15th amendments to the US Constitution. Uh, so these commemorations become more numerous, more prolific, uh, and a really important form of Black uh, cultural traditions that uh, really articulated the dynamic relationship between personal uh, experiences and public memories of slavery, war, and emancipation. So these celebrations would include, as I've suggested, processions. And these, as you can see from the top left photograph, often included uh, richly decorated wagons and horses. Um, they, these gatherings included uh, uh, gathering together in parks or church grounds, speeches by community leaders, ministers, civil rights activists band performances, uh, singing secular and sacred songs, uh, baseball games, cycling races, dances. And uh, I want to pause over the picnic and the importance of the picnic, particularly for celebrations held in August, because food was an important element of the day's events. Uh, families brought their own picnic baskets or a grand meal was provided uh, sometimes by the women of a local black congregation who uh, would provide a noontime meal uh, or, uh, or an evening supper, sometimes as a fundraiser for their churches uh, or for the benefit of local needy families. So this emphasis on food was an emphasis and uh, this was really elevated uh, the role of women uh, in these celebrations and newspaper reports uh, always describe, you know, as one report from Mount Pleasant, Iowa uh, said, the immense table was supplied with the substantials and delicacies of the season in great abundance. Uh, in Keokuk, uh, uh, people brought dinner baskets. In Dubuque in 1870, there was an oyster dinner, excuse me. And in 1896 in Des Moines, there was a grand barbecue, including ox, mutton, and pork, uh, which was a fundraising effort. So, uh, Again, I just want to make the point that the amount and variety of well-prepared food was not only uh, an act of nurturance for the community, but also a symbol of Black female accomplishment. The other element of the celebrations that I want to emphasize is that always there was a reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, always. And in fact, in 1876, the Des Moines celebration had to be suspended for two hours while someone went home to find a copy of the proclamation that could be read. Now this reading was often given by an honored community member and uh, advance advertising sometimes tried to draw crowds by uh, noting the popularity of the reader for that day. Um, I want to make the note that women were rarely invited to the speaker's platform at uh, Emancipation Day celebrations, but they did often participate in reading the proclamation as part of the exercises. This was perhaps the most constant and unchanging 
part of Iowa's uh, celebrations. And I just would ask the people attending to pause uh, and think about whether you have ever read the proclamation or have had it read to you. Now, I want you to know that the proclamation, if you haven't read it, is wordy, it's dry, it's technical. It is not adorned with beautiful prose. So it takes a very skilled reader to engage an audience uh, in this document. I also want you to keep in mind that for most of American history since 1863, only Black Americans were intimately familiar with this document. In other words, white Americans would not read this document at July 4th celebrations, right? So again, these photographs that I'm showing you on this slide are, are not from Iowa, with the exception of the image in the lower left corner. Um, and this is a photograph of uh, the regimental flag that was carried by Iowa's Black Civil War Regiment, the 60th US Colored Infantry into the Civil War. It was a flag that was sewn by Iowa's Black women who gathered uh, to, to make this flag. Um, and after the Civil War, um, the flag would have been brought to uh, every celebration in Des Moines, uh, which is probably uh, where it was held. Uh, it, the flag would have been treated with great respect, as would have been Black Civil War veterans who were always given an honored role in the emancipation celebrations until, of course, the 1920s and 1930s, when that generation uh, finally passed away. So in the 19th century, uh, uh, many Iowa communities held, held celebrations. Uh, Burlington, Clorinda, Davenport, DeWitt, Dubuque, Fort Madison, Iowa City, Oskaloosa, Ottumwa, all were having celebrations, sometimes in August, sometimes in January. And even if uh, your own community did not have a celebration, it was very common uh, to travel to attend celebrations in other communities. Uh, that was very common. And so uh, as the 19th century uh, drew to a close, uh, these celebrations sometimes included hundreds and thousands of participants. So these were very much kind of like a, a county fair, except it had a very important uh, historical public memory and political uh, intent. Now, uh, I do want to note that emancipation celebrations sometimes revealed struggles over race and civic culture. And an example was in Des Moines in 1863 when white citizens organized their celebration. And in response in 1864 and 1865, black residents of the city took over organizing the celebration, uh, including a full program of events, several hundred people uh, attended. Uh, and uh, again with, uh, a parade and uh, marching by the Civil War veterans and important lectures. So uh, it's important to keep in mind here that some of the people who attended uh, these celebrations were white Iowans and some of them were allies, but others were not. They attended, uh, they thought to be entertained uh, or to mock uh, black Iowans in their celebrations. Uh, I wanted to uh, emphasize, too, the role of the Black church in Iowa's celebrations. Um, these are photographs of some of Iowa's earliest uh, Black uh, AME churches. And these churches, their congregations, their ministers, and the women's organizations uh, in those congregations uh, were all central to emancipation celebrations. And so were the structures themselves. Uh, these were the first institutions that Black Iowans built and their members held deep commitments to these churches, both as a sacred home, 
but also serving as kind of secular community centers. And many Emancipation Day celebrations began in the Black church and ended up there. And in fact, several celebrations that I have researched uh, ended at the church with something called experience meetings, where individuals spoke to their own experience of slavery. Sharing these painful memories of torture, of family separations and abuse, both sustained uh, the memory of slavery and also helped shape public memory of slavery, how the war ended, uh, and the role of African Americans in uh, the uh, Union victory. And I suspect that these meetings were held in churches in part because they were a safe space where participants might have been shielded from whites who might have ridiculed them. Uh, moving on to the 20th century, what changes in these celebrations in the 20th century? One important thing that changes is that the last generations of people who experienced slavery and the uh, veterans of the Civil War were dying out. So the people who were now participating were the descendants of those people, perhaps without a direct experience of slavery. But it was very important to those who gathered uh, in the 20th century to keep alive what they knew to be the history uh, of slavery and emancipation. Because at the same time, uh, many white Americans were starting to create a very contrasting history of the Civil War and slavery that talked about slavery as a, as a good experience for African Americans and attempted to elevate uh, the plantation South as a pleasant environment for everyone. So the Emancipation Day celebrations really kept alive a, a public history and memory that counteracted this racist uh, history that was being perpetrated. Uh, another change that happened was the size of gatherings. And here you see a head, headline from the Des Moines Register in 1937, noting that 5,000 African-Americans attended their Emancipation Day celebration. So again, uh, this was very important change. And the other most notable change in the 20th century uh, was the uh, new role of national civil rights organizations in organizing the celebrations in Iowa. Uh, on the left, uh, you can see highlighted that the uh, Afro-American Council uh, organized uh, the Des Moines celebration in 1909. This was a predecessor of the uh, NAACP organized to uh, claim uh, civil rights and support people uh, it, filing uh, uh, lawsuits to gain their rights. So this is important. It reminds us that these national organizations, both the Afro-American Council and the NAACP, became very active in Iowa and in very strong chapters. On the right from 1949, you see that the Waterloo celebration was sponsored and organized by that city's chapter of the NAACP. So I want to wrap up so we have plenty of time for questions and comments by talking about how we find this historical record of emancipation celebrations in Iowa. Um, and I have relied very heavily on newspaper articles uh, from the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and many times I have found these reports in uh, white published newspapers. But beginning in 1894, uh, Iowa was the beneficiary of a new black published newspaper called the Iowa State Bystander. And uh, this newspaper is uh, just a gem, a treasure house of information about uh, the history of Iowa's black communities. And in, in my case, uh, 
reports of Emancipation Day celebrations. And I, I raise this fact that we can find reports in the bystander because white newspaper reports were sometimes uh, uh, resorted to racist caricatures in their reporting. Uh, so it's important to have this newspaper published by Iowa African Americans, an advocate of Black progress, reporting uh, more objectively, really, on these events in Black communities. So um, I have found in this newspaper research, uh, in which I will say I was assisted by many graduate students, um, I found a record of more than 200 Emancipation Day activities in more than 30 uh, Iowa communities. Um, however, it is possible that records of these celebrations could also be found in family photo albums, in church records, in the records of local chapters of the NAACP, and then in repositories like the Iowa State Historical Society, county historical societies, and public libraries. So again, if this topic interests you, I really urge you to look in your community and your family and your extended family uh, records for uh, additional information. I know the State Historical Society uh, would, would love to learn about uh, the record uh, that we haven't uncovered yet of these celebrations. So I'm going to uh, stop the, uh, the uh, slideshow and uh, welcome uh, your questions. OK, um, we have several questions. Great. The first one is, were there ever cases of mistaken identity with slave catchers capturing free Black people? There was, and it, it wasn't a case of mistaken identity. It was an effort to commodify people who could be sold South. Uh, and uh, one notable instance uh, is the case of Milton Howard, who was a free African-American uh, living in eastern Iowa with his family. And as a child, he was kidnapped and sold south into slavery. So again, I, I want to be clear, this isn't mistaken identity. This is a purposeful effort to, to seize people who were vulnerable because of US law and were uh, kidnapped and sold south. And it was quite a money-making enterprise. We have someone asking i have heard that the word picnic actually has a racist origin as in picking someone to lynch is this true and can you talk more about this i have heard that but i have not seen it closely documented uh, so I, I i can't add at all to that conversation i have not researched it um and a third Question, that is a lot of locations. I can't imagine those same places having Black populations today, much less holding emancipation celebrations. Were they targeted or could they hold them in peace? Okay, so there's, uh, I guess I have two things to say about that. Yes, it is really important to note that both large and small Black communities in Iowa's history regularly organize these celebrations. And it's a reminder of how extensive and rich Iowa's history is and how important Black history is to Iowa history. So that's one thing. Many of those, what had been very significant communities in the 19th century dwindled uh, in, in large part because people migrated uh, to cities, larger cities, where there were uh, there was a larger Black infrastructure, but also employment that was really important. So, you know, as we see John Deere and, and uh, other uh, corporations willing to hire African Americans, there was considerable migration from the smaller communities like Clorinda, like Mount Pleasant, um, to uh, larger cities that had more economic opportunities. Uh, 
But it is, it, it is incredibly impressive how many of these celebrations were held and how it must have shaped civic culture uh, in Iowa's small communities for these public processions to be held, speeches, um, and all kinds of social activities. It would have been a really important reminder to all Iowans uh, of the very specific history and experience of African Americans. Any other questions that uh, I could answer for people or comments that you have? I don't see any so far, but please, oh, um, someone is raising their hand. Um, let me allow this person to talk just a second, if I can find her. Um, oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> Janet, maybe you could post your question in the Q&A. Yes, because the um, attendee list is not alphabetized. It is uh, by order of when people joined, so it might take me a while to find. She may have posted in the Q&A. Ah, here we go. Yes, no, she did. Um, or someone did. <laughs> Were there ever county state politicians who tried to prevent these events from taking place? What were reactions in these communities? Would they ignore the attempts of scare tactics or did they sadly work? I have not read any account of a successful interference by white Iowans in the organization of these celebrations. Uh, and, you know, that could be for who knows what reason. Uh, certainly it's true that uh, restaurants and bars and groceries and hotels maybe in Iowa communities uh, profited from drawing, you know, hundreds of people into the community. So perhaps they welcome these celebrations, you know, as a way to uh, make some cash on uh, Emancipation Day. So, but I have not seen any record of successful uh, interference uh, in, in organizing these events. And many events were attended by white politicians who were out to, you know, Republican candidates or office holders who wanted to secure the black vote uh, after the 15th Amendment. Ah, here's Janet's question. How did you come to this topic? And can you talk a little bit about your book, Emancipation's Diaspora? Right. So I did uh, do this research as part of a larger book project that I did. It was, the book is titled Emancipation's Diaspora, Race and Reconstruction in the Upper Midwest. So this is a book uh, where I look at Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Uh, during the Civil War and during Reconstruction to see how emancipation occurred, uh, how it was received, the experience of Black residents of the Midwest, and also the experience of the 7,000 or so uh, formerly enslaved people who migrate up to the Upper Midwest uh, during and after the Civil War. So it's a book really about uh, black communities and racial politics that arise out of the Civil War's destruction of slavery. So that's how I uh, became interested in the topic. Um, and uh, I decided to uh, do a little focused work on it in order to publish an article in the uh, History Journal of the Iowa State Historical Society. Um, so uh, if you're interested, you could look it up. It's the Annals of Iowa History, and uh, the article is, is in there. Uh, but it was really important for me to come to terms with how Black Iowans understood their experience and their history uh, as the decades followed uh, emancipation. Uh, and it was really quite informative for me to do this work. This is just one venue in which Iowans, you know, claim that history, 
and uh, advocated it in the public sphere. Other people wrote memoirs or uh, gave speeches, and some even uh, wrote obituaries uh, for their family members who had been held as slaves, talking about their experience of slavery. So this is part of a larger claim to a public memory uh, in Iowa's Black communities. Thanks for that question. There's a uh, more of a comment. I find it interesting that we have pictures of Buxton, Iowa, but none with an emancipation celebration. I will check with other family members to see if they have any. That's excellent. That's really great. I would be so thrilled to know that there were pictures. And you know what? I'm, I'm pretty convinced they must be out there somewhere because photographs were taken in, in other states and other communities. So that would be fabulous. And this seems like a good time to mention that Dr. Schwalm has a website, leslieschwalm.com. So if you do find pictures or anything you'd like to share with her, you can go to her website. Um, Thank you for that. That would be a good way to contact her. Um, was there any connection between groups supporting the Underground Railroad in Iowa and the groups leading the first Emancipation Day celebrations in Iowa? Uh, from what I can see, uh, the uh, earliest celebrations of uh, emancipation in the British West Indies were organized by and attended by Black Iowans. After the Civil War, uh, white Iowans who had been abolitionist allies uh, sometimes attended and participated. Um, so yeah, there was some carryover and some allies in the white community. Um, I, I tend to understand their participation is as audience members rather than organizers, right? So this was still an event organized within Black communities, but uh, uh, white allies were, of course, welcome to attend. Uh, white hecklers, you know, uh, did attend and, you know, often just dis could disrupt uh, what was a joyful day. Uh, but indeed, white allies would attend these celebrations. Were there any social leaders or student organizations in Iowa City? that promoted awareness of emancipation efforts in Juneteenth developments during these early times? Hmm. Well, I can't uh, remember the exact dates of these celebrations I have seen listed for Iowa City, but I have no doubt that our uh, the congregation of our uh, Bethel AME Church would have been very active in this. Iowa City's AME Church was founded in 1868, uh, and among its founding members was the mother of Alex Clark, Alexander Clark, who rose to such prominence as a civil rights leader. Um, Rebecca Howard and her husband uh, would be uh, very important in that congregation, and I just, I, I have no doubt that they would have organized uh, celebration days. Uh, and then uh, later on, the uh, African American Women's Club movement that developed in at the turn of the 20th century um, were always very interested in Black history. So again, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't also play a role. Do you have ideas about how to make this history more visible? Uh, uh, yes. Well, uh, I would love to see this taught uh, in our public schools. It should be a part of the Iowa history that uh, our children are allowed to learn and encouraged to learn. Um, uh, I will say that uh, there is another project I'm involved in called the Iowa Colored Conventions Project. This is a, a digital public history project where we are tracing the history of what were called by the participants colored conventions where African Americans across the state would gather uh, almost annually uh, to talk about civil rights and, and how to claim them and enforce uh, political and civil rights. Uh, Iowa, of all the states in the United States, 
had the most colored conventions. And so that project is a collaborative project with a, a, a group of dedicated researchers. And we hope that our website will go live uh, later this summer. Um, and we will try to advertise that as widely as possible. And you will find some uh, additional information on Iowa Black history there. Well, this is more of a comment. Dorothy Schweitzer wrote a book about Buxton, Iowa. I roomed with her in 1976 while she was getting her PhD. Um, she was an Iowa State instructor, so it would be through Iowa State Press. Um, it had a lot of, it was published around then and had a lot of illustrations. Um, and another comment, uh, see the cover of the New Yorker, June 20th, 2022, um, 157 years of Juneteenth and Elizabeth Columbia, maybe that's the author probably. Um, but yeah, people are sharing resources. That's great, thank you. And seeing how Iowa communities started part, partaking in these celebrations so long ago in the mid 1800s, why might it have taken the state until the 90s to make it an official holiday? Ah, I, I love that question. Um, I think this is complicated. Um, having the state make it an official holiday was not needed by Iowa's Black communities to build and sustain this tradition. Uh, I wanna be clear about this. This is a grassroots movement. Um, on the other hand, it is important to have the state recognize this as an important part of our history. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, Governor Vilsack uh, listened to the organizers in Des Moines and became convinced that it was time to recognize Juneteenth. Um, I, I do think it's important to keep in mind that Juneteenth had Texas origins. It was a Texas tradition. It has now become kind of the modern uh, day of commemoration, which is really important. But I, I also hope we all remember that there's a long history behind this of several holidays that African Americans made uh, a tradition around. Uh, so why did it take so long? Well. We might ask, you know, why it took so long for uh, white legislators in Iowa to enforce civil and political rights. Why were schools still being segregated even after two important state Supreme Court decisions in the 19th century? You know, civil rights in law are one thing, but in practice can be quite different. That's a, that brings up the Clarks. <laughs> yes, yes. Iowa has a fascinating legal history and the Alexander Clark of Muscatine was um, involved in school desegregation. Right, in 1868, uh, Alexander Clark and his uh, wife, Catherine Clark, decided to send their young daughter uh, Susan uh, to the uh, exclusively white public school, uh, and this would lead to uh, a state Supreme Court decision uh, arguing that uh, public schools had to be desegregated, which is great, it's important, it's a landmark decision, but it did not achieve desegregation. And in 1874, two mothers, two black mothers in Keokuk, similarly went to court to allow their children to attend uh, uh, both the high school, which was exclusively for whites, and the neighborhood grammar school, which was exclusively for whites. And they too would win a landmark state Supreme Court decision, uh, which did lead to the desegregation of schools in Keokuk, but not elsewhere in the state. And uh, one of the unfortunate byproducts of the Keokuk decision is that Keokuk African Americans had built a very large and important black school. And that school, when it was desegregated to admit whites, 
lost, all of the black teachers were fired. And the Keokuk school system would not hire another black school teacher until the 1970s. So uh, again, you know, to have the official proclamation of the state is great, but uh, I think we really have to uh, 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 cheer uh, Iowa's black communities who have taken it on their shoulders to be sure uh, that we remember slavery and emancipation and the role of African Americans in our history. Someone else comments, there's more than one book about Buxton. Um, yes. And someone else comments that there's, do you remember, do you recommend any resources where one can learn more about Alexander Clark? Uh, you can actually Google Alexander Clark's name. Um, there's uh, uh, a couple of people in Muscatine who have worked very hard to recuperate his history. Um, you can find published articles about Alexander Clark. Uh, the uh, Colored Conventions Project has quite a bit of information that we'll be making available. Um, there's a collection of essays on Black history in Iowa called Outside In that has some information. My own book, Emancipation's Diaspora, offers quite a bit of information. Uh, so of, of all Black Iowans, uh, Alexander Clark has probably gotten the most scholarly attention. Um, I do want to point out, though, that his entire family uh, were civil rights activists, uh, not just Alexander. His wife, his daughters, his son, they all participated in breaking barriers, uh, racial barriers in Iowa. And his son, his son was the first Black graduate of the University of Iowa Law School, and he was the second. <laughs> right, right. And his daughter, Rebecca, uh, was probably the first student, the first Black student to attend Grinnell College. Uh, as I mentioned, Susan uh, gained the right to attend the White Grammar School. Um, so there was a lot of, of activism uh, in the family as a whole. Someone mentions there's a school named after Susan Clark. Um, uh, there's an Alexander Clark School, uh, I believe, in Iowa City. Is that right? I think so. But thank you. Yeah. Um, we have about three minutes left if anyone wants to add another quick question or two. I want to thank everyone for participating for these great questions. Um, again, go home, look through your photo albums, talk to your family members, uh, talk to your pastor. You know, are there more records out there that we can find to discover uh, more about this important history? Well, and thank you, Dr. Schwong. It was a wonderful program. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, and if there are no other questions, I think we will sign off. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.